Michael Moore was being interviewed on CBS's 60 Minutes, and more or less in passing, he happened to say, the chances of any of us dying in a terrorist attack is very, very, very small. Um, and his interlocutor, Bob Simon, says, no one sees the world like that. Um, and to my, the thing I like about these statements is both of them are true. Um, and there may be some change lately, particularly after the Boston bombings, uh, more people saying, you know, how big is the threat, actually? And that's the main thing I would like to discuss uh, right now. Um, this is where I'd like to basically start and uh, uh, deal with it. Uh, what you have to do with the, the issue of risk, risk is find out, you know, what the risk is. And there's an easy way to measure that, which is basically how many people die of this hazard per year in the United States. Um, as you can see, about one in every 540 people die within the United States from, um, from um, uh, cancer. Uh, therefore, uh, generally speaking, if your chances of being killed are, are, are higher than one in 100,000, that's generally seen to be an unacceptable risk. And you should be spending a lot of money on that. And of course, we do spend a huge amount of money on cancer. Um, the, uh, but I'd like to, and then you can see the other things going down, and I'll talk about a few other things as, I, as we go through. But let me, let me deal, first of all, with traffic accidents. Uh, your chance of being killed in a traffic accident is about 1 in 8,200. Um, that's extremely high. Uh, the, um, uh, and, um, and we worry about a lot, uh, and should. Uh, this is the, um, the uh, annual, uh, this is the number of people killed in the United States over the life of the automobile since 1900. <clears throat> As you can see, it started out very low, but that had to do with the fact that there weren't any automobiles, um, then, gradu then gradually increased. Um, if you get to the 1930s, you get certain effects. Uh, the, the depression caused the accident rates actually go, the accident total to actually go down, the number of people killed, because people didn't have enough money to drive. Uh, it, it then rose again, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, after that, then fell again at the last part of the, end of the recession, uh, about 1937, kicked in again and dropped, uh, dropped again. Uh, this is World War II, a rather substantial drop. Basically, World War II saved about 40 or 50,000 lives. Um, this was because, um, first of all, they drafted all the bad drivers, which are 19-year-old males. Uh, many of them may have died in jeep accidents overseas, but th those don't add, add, add in. And the other is that they basically um, uh, 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 they forced driving rates down by uh, rationing gasoline in order to save on rubber, basically on tires. Uh, the result of that is people actually had, there's probably a positive benefit because people now had to walk to church and walk to the movies and walk to restaurants as opposed to taking their cars there. So there might have been a positive health benefit as well as the fact of not using the car. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was one of the big drops of uh, traffic accidents. Uh, it resounded, it came back obviously after, after the war and really hit its peak in terms of total deaths, about 50,000 or 55,000 in the 60s. Since that time, there's been a decline. Uh, most of these declines are having to do with economic downturns, including probably the one that's most recent. In fact, maybe we're coming out of the recession because the 2012 figures <clears throat> seem to indicate that there's been an uptick in automobile deaths. Okay, well, the, the issue I'd like to deal with here is uh, this. Uh, uh, the, uh, what we're doing, basically, with automobiles is accepting this incredible risk. The, if, if we keep it more or less the same level we're in here, it means that by the end of the century, uh, between three and four million people will die from automobile accidents. Uh, it's quite possible that one or two of them is now in this room. It's, you know, it's very common. Everybody knows people have been killed or badly injured in automobile accidents. Um, and I'd like to propose a law which will not go very far in Congress. But this law, if passed, would save um, some uh, maybe 3 million people, over the Americans, over the course of the century. Very simple law, about 13 words. Um, the speed limit for private passenger automobiles in this country shall be 13 miles an hour. Now, in D.C., that would actually be speeding it up, of course, but uh, in most places, that's not the case. Now, if you're opposed to that law, uh, that means that you're willing to pay two to three to four million lives over the course of this century uh, to keep the private passenger automobile. Um, uh, and so what we've got is an acceptable risk at a very high level. We really love automobiles. Um, we want to keep them. Now, that one, one possibility of this, um, it, it should be pointed out, that you don't need automobiles to move people around. 
the New York taxi, the, the New York um, uh, subway system moves millions of people every year, and except for those who try to jump between the, the between the cars, um, uh, it kills none of them. Uh, so if you only have taxi cabs, buses, and very slow-moving passenger automobiles, you could you could save uh, literally millions of lives over the course of the century. And we don't do that. In other words, the gain from having automobiles seems to be worth it. Now, what we have done is throw a lot of money at the problem, and that's been incredibly successful. Uh, this is the, the, the rate of death per, um, per uh, passenger mile. What's happened is there's far, far more cars than there used to be, far, far, far more driving, but your chance of being killed in a given automobile ride uh, has gone down from about 25 for 100,000 miles down to just three or four. And this has, and this, as you can see, there's no World War II effect because this is just how many people die per passenger mile, um, and it's been a, a major improvement. But the problem is that uh, when you do that, people still drive even more. So it's very hard to see how you can get this death rate a whole lot lower. Uh, and so essentially, again, if you if you disagree with my pr modest proposal, uh, you are willing to accept. Uh, um, with near certainty, as far as anything can be predicted in social science, uh, two to three to four million Americans to die over the course of this century. Um, let me turn to some of the other issues, two or, uh, two or three other ones. Uh, the third one on there is homicide. And let me sort of explain what, the way I think that sort of works. Your chance of being killed per year is one in 22,000. One out of every 22,000 Americans is killed in a homicide each year. Now, that's not as bad as automobiles, but on the other hand, automobiles have a positive gain, whereas homicide doesn't seem to have much of any. And everybody would agree, I think, that that's unfortunately high, um, though it's not as bad as it has been in the past and uh, might be in uh, many other countries. Um, okay, but you may be uncomfortable with one in 22,000. Okay, well, there's a few things you can do which are really make reduce your danger quite a bit. And these are many of these are really cheap. Uh, one of these is to not deal in drugs. Um, now, I know some of you may have always, your fondest uh, uh, plan was always to be a dope peddler, and you'd have to give up on that great plan. But if you, for those uh, other people, uh, basically, that's not much of an inconvenience. You didn't plan to be a, dub, a drug addict or drug peddler anyway, um, and so he's saying out of the drug trade is pretty easy. Another thing is just sort of street smarts, you know, don't walk down dark alleys at 3 o'clock in the morning and so forth. So that, those, those, are, those are minor inconveniences and well worth the price. So if you do both of those things and similar sorts of things, you can probably uh, change your homicide chances to maybe one in 80,000 or one in 100,000, one in 60,000, something like that. Okay, there's also something you do which does cost a lot of money, and people do generally, which is try to move to safe neighborhoods. And so when people buy houses, one of the things that is not trivial in their consideration is how safe is the neighborhood, not only for me, but also for my children. Um, and uh, that, obviously, is the biggest expenditure most people ever make. Um, and there are other reasons to buy a house. The schools may be better and so forth, but it's certainly there. Houses that are in safe neighborhoods command a higher price than the equal house in a not safe aid neighborhood. So you pay more. Okay. Maybe with the, if you live in a safe neighborhood and do the other things, you can get it up to one in 100,000, 120,000, rather than one in 22,000. A lot better. That's not perfect. The next question is, why, if you really think safety is so important, why don't you hire a bodyguard? Uh, it, uh, you can probably buy, a, buy uh, um, uh, if you've got enough money, uh, maybe you can, it may even be tax deductible, um, you can hire a bodyguard for, I don't know, forty or fifty thousand dollars a year. And virtually nobody does that. Why not? It will, if your safety is so important, your children's safety is so important, why don't you spend more money to make them even safer? Well, what you say basically is it isn't worth the money. It isn't worth spending additional money on, the, on this hazard. Uh, because it, I'm comfortable with it if it's only one in 100,000. I'd rather spend the money on something else. I might spend something on something cheap, like putting better door locks in my house. Uh, that, that's okay. That'll increase my safety a little bit and doesn't cost much money. But I'm not willing to hire a bodyguard. Why not? Well, safety is not the most important thing. Paying for your college education, paying for your children's education, et cetera, other things, going on uh, a vacation to the Bahamas, whatever you want to spend that money on. So the point is that the risk has become acceptable. Uh, let me give you two other examples. One is drowning in a bathtub. Uh, the number of people who die, drown in a bathtub every year is about one in a million. One, about three, three to th three to four hundred people die every year drowning in a bathtub. Um, now, people talk about terrorism being this big dramatic risk. Well, drowning in a bathtub is really horrible uh, for about half the people who drown in the bathtub because they're babies and children who are being bathed. 
uh, their mother is called away or something, their parent is called away, and suddenly they slip under and die. Now, they, it's hard to think of anything more heart-wrenching and horrible than that. Um, but we don't, we accept this, even though it's, even though it's heart-wrenching, even though a non-trivial, well, a small number, but nonetheless uh, a non-trivial number of people die each year, um, and, 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 and half the deaths or so are very, that, that are very emotional. We don't, we don't have a bill saying let's fill up all bathtubs in the country with concrete. Uh, or even put a label, warning label on a bathtub saying, you know, be careful here. Or even, as far as I know, sending out uh, messages to pediatricians saying, warn your new, your new parents about this danger. Maybe it's in there, I don't know, but I don't think so. So again, that's an acceptable risk. It's heart-wrenching in, in a lot of ways. It seems sort of stupid, um, you know, how can you drown in a bathtub? But when it actually happens, you can see the horror of it. Okay, the third thing um, would be uh, terrorism. Your chance of being killed is one in 3.5 million per year. Um, generally speaking, uh, for an American over a long period of time, including, as you can see by the numbers there, 9-11. Uh, um, and, so uh, and also the Timothy McVeigh bombing. It's, this is not only by Muslim terrorists, by any kind of terrorists. Uh, and that's basically where the terrorism, um, uh, but where the discussion should basically begin. Uh, essentially, let me get to this, uh, the, the wrong question is constantly being asked. The wrong question is this question, are we safer? The right question is, how safe are we? Uh, or as a risk analyst put it in 2002, how much should we be willing to pay for a small reduction in probabilities that are already extremely low? So the discussion of terrorism, and every newspaper article uh, should say this on page, in the first paragraph essentially, your chance of being killed is one in 3.5 million. That's where you should start. Maybe that's not safe enough, just like being one in 22,000 isn't safe enough in terms of homicides. But you should basically say that. That's where it should begin. Uh, it should begin. As far as I can see, no public official has said this publicly uh, since uh, in, la in the last decade, uh, with one exception. And that was Mayor Bloomberg, uh, who said, get a life in 2007, said, get a life, your chance of being killed by a terrorist is about, is about the same as being killed by lightning. 